Good morning, church. God is good. Amen. God is good. All right, we're so glad that you are here with us to worship with us. And um, if you are watching via um, live stream, we welcome you to our um, worship service. Welcome to CFLC. Um, let's stand up and let's prepare our hearts to worship God. Um, awaken our soul, Lord.
worship the Lord. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. Oh, how great Thou art! How great Thou art! Come on, come on, church, let's worship the Lord.
accept our praises, Lord God. Sanctify these gifts, Lord Jesus, as we move to the next part of offering, Lord God. You said, Lord, offer the, the unblemished lamb, the first fruit, Lord, the firstborn in all your um, produce, in all your, your animals, Lord God. Lord, but you sacrificed the best, Lord God. You gave us your son, Jesus, the firstborn, Lord God, your beloved son, Lord, the unblemished lamb. Lord, we offer, Lord, as we offer our gifts, Lord God, may we offer it, Lord God, with a pure heart, Lord. May we offer it, Lord God, with joyfulness and gladness, Lord God. Lord, it is not the amount of the gift, Father, but it's the heart, Lord, that gives, Lord. And so, Lord, I pray, Lord God, for faithful hearts, Lord, among your people, Father. And I pray, Lord God, that we will give not out of our surplus, Lord God, but in our our poverty we give you, Lord God, because it's yours. You deserve it, Lord God. We give you, Lord, the best, Lord, that we can give you, Lord. Lord, accept our gifts, Lord. Accept our offerings, Lord God. And Lord, use it, Lord, for the glory of your name, Lord. Use it, Lord God, to touch more people, Lord, to know you, Lord. Lord, you said to number our days, Lord, that we may gain a heart of wisdom, Lord God, as we give, Lord God. We think of those who doesn't know you yet, Lord God. May you use these gifts, Lord God. May we give wisely, Lord God. And Lord, may we just give, Lord, because we love you and we obey you, Lord God. Lord, um, we would just thank you, Lord Jesus. We cannot outgive you, Lord God. You already, uh, everything belongs to you, Lord. So this is just, Lord God, to discipline us, to teach us, Lord, how to give like you have given. God, to teach us how to love like you have loved us, Lord. And so, Lord, accept these gifts, Lord. Sanctify these gifts, Lord God. May it glorify your name, Jesus. May you, glory, may you be glorified, Lord. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord, because you are worthy. We praise you, Lord, because you are holy. And there is no other God beside you that you deserve the praise, the glory, and honor, Lord, only in your name. Let us sing together.
Hallelujah. Let's uh, greet one another with the love of the Lord. Then just wave your hands to the person next to you and say, You are blessed. Amen. Good morning. How's everybody this morning? Good. All right. Can we try that again? No. How's everybody this morning? Good. All right. Looks like uh, we're growing in numbers again. All right. Oh, we got Hanami with us. Hello. All right. So we're continuing our uh, series in Battle of the Minds. Who of you among here always have battled in our minds? I think that's many of us, whether we admit it or not. So last week, uh, Pastor Sam um, started uh, the series and uh, he mentioned about how we have to renew our mind, right? That we can't conform to the world. And uh, with our minds, we're supposed to uh, think positively in our lives, think positively about church, and think positively about others. But somehow, even though we want to do that, we really want to do that, but somehow, in our mind, there's still a battle that sometimes it makes it hard for us to do such thing. It makes it hard for us to think positively. And we're going to find out about that this morning. Um, uh, as I was studying this sermon, I, I came upon this story. How, how many of you know the Fortune 500 company? I think we, yeah, people with a lot of money, looks like they know about that. <laughs> They also have a magazine about Fortune 500, right? So I read, I'm not sure when this was, but uh, there was a time when they need to change their, their president of the company, and they were going to um, promote the vice president to the next president. And he was only 38 years old, kind of like my age, five years ago. <laughs> but... Um, they, they, they saw so much potential from this guy. Um, they wooed him. They awed him. They think he's great. And they're very excited for the new change in their company. So all morning, they were, um, all morning they were interviewing this guy. And everything that they heard, all the answers that he has um, um, given were all just perfect. All were just spot on. Um, so they were very excited for, to announce to him um, that he will get that, that position. But here comes lunchtime, so obviously they need to take a break. And unknowingly, when that guy went to a certain cafeteria, a lot of the board who were deciding also went to the same cafeteria. And again, this is just not planned. It just happened that way. But the young man didn't know that the people were also in that same place. 
So there we go. He's, he's, you know, do you know that setup for the cafeteria a long time ago? Maybe we still do it now. There's a tray, right? You get you put you put the food in the tray, then you show it to the cashier, and whatever food's there, then you pay for it. But this young man, not knowing that he's being watched behind him, put some uh, you know those butter patties, like the square butter. I guess at the time it was only like three cents, so this must be like a long time ago. But I think now the butter is free, anyways, right? Because when you buy like bagels, it takes it's like two dollars anyway, so they better make that butter free. But anyways, so he hid those butter um, under the napkins. So he put napkins on top of those butter. So now those butter was hidden on those napkins. So when it's time to pay, he just paid for the food as visible. The food was inside the butter. He didn't declare. So he pretty much cheated by six cents, right? It's just two butters. So he just kept that and didn't pay for it, didn't say anything to it, and just moved on. But the people behind him were like, um, what just happened here, right? So after lunch, they were, it's supposed to be a victorious um, celebration. They were gonna announce that he's gonna get the job, but instead, the guy got fired. And this is a true story, and he got fired. The Bible did say, if you can't be trusted with little things, right? How can you be trusted with the big things? So maybe for him, it's just, eh, it's just a couple of pieces of butter. But that's where it all starts, right? So what I'm trying to say is, he could have avoided that, but there's just something in us that just, just wants to just <laughs> still try to do something wrong, even though we already know that it's bad. We just do it anyways. Uh, there's another story that I heard about a, <clears throat> a hamster. Have you, have you seen the a hamster cage, and then there's uh, wood shavings in the floor, and then there's a wheel, right? They're supposed to go inside the wheel and just run and run. But this hamster decided to go up on top of the wheel, like, like that, right? And then he was just stretching his back, and you could just guess what will happen. The wheel will continue, and then he fell, <laughs> head face. Head first. So obviously he was hurt because he was shaken up. But guess what he will do right after that? Goes right back up there and fall again. Goes right back again and fall again. It sounds silly, right? It's too foolish to think. But what's more foolish is that people do the same thing, right? We go into this sin. Then we get hurt from a sin. We already know we're going to get hurt from that same sin. And then what do we do? We do it over and over again. Like our children, right? Do you already know when they play too much screen time, they'll get in trouble, but they do it anyways, right? I see that in my own kids, and I, I bet some of you as well. Even us adults, right? There's some screen time that we know we're not supposed to be looking, but we look anyways. And then we just can't stop. We just go back. We just go back. Even for, for some example, even like simple as having diabetes, right? We still can't stop drinking our soda because that Coke is just so good, right? So what's happening? Why do we do that? And that's what we're going to learn this morning. We're going to learn about sin and its power over us. Thank you. And this sin starts as a battle in our mind. You agree with me? We think about it, and then sometimes we do good, sometimes we do bad. And you and I have experienced that. We are slave to sin, according to the Bible. And for some of us, we were slave to sin. And we will be slave to sin if we don't do anything about it. We can try to break free from this enslavement to sin on our own. But we will find, we will find ourselves in a cycle. Just over and over and over again. Just like the hamster. We end up failing 
But then we do it again, and then we do it again, over and over. Who's with me? Are we all the same? Or are we all too perfect? In our dinner last night, in a dinner table, I had all the family, and I was asking, hey, can you give me some pointers? What are some sins that we do over and over? And nobody can give me an answer. So I'm like, wow, you guys are too perfect. How about our church? Are we perfect or are you, are you with me? Good. So what to do? What do we do? You know, there's this famous, uh, uh, famous words in the Philippines, right? Gusto kong bumait pero di ko magawa. Right? And I believe they actually got that in the Bible. We're going to read that. And that's exactly how they said it. Um, so we're going to talk about how we can battle this sin, this battle in our mind, and who we will need and what we will need to do. And we we're going to be reading this in our book of Romans. And as we read the scripture, my hope and my prayer is that we can remember that we can live a life in the spirit. That leads to freedom from the power of sin. So if you have your Bibles with you, please open Romans 7. And we're going to be going to verse 21 to 25. So let's read that together. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. I'm actually going to read this in NLT, um, if you don't mind. So let me start over. I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. Sounds familiar? This power makes me slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law. But because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. Pray with me. Uh, Father God, thank you, Lord, for your words this morning. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would just be my mouth this morning. May I be your mouthpiece, oh, Lord. Lord, these are your people. You know what they're going through. You know the sins that we're struggling with, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you would just uh, bring light to that, Lord, and expose our sin. Even if we don't know that it's a sin, expose it, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you would create a clean heart in us that we can battle the power of sin in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So just a little background. Uh, in Romans 7, the audience is the church at Rome. And Apostle Paul is the author, and he is not writing to the unbelievers here. He is actually writing to the believers in the church of Rome. Those church, the church there is already established. So that's something to keep in mind as we read this. So in my message today, I came up with three essays that we're going to talk about. Uh, sin, statutes, not statue, it's statutes. And I'm going to explain about that um, in a little bit. And the last S would be Savior. So I was thinking about that SS. I thought it was like the SSS, but it's, I guess it's SSA, Social Security. Um, <laughs> And I know a lot of us uh, rely on that social security, but there's better thing than that, the spiritual security. And that's what we're going to uh, be diving in this morning. So let's talk about the first S, sin. So we're, we're actually going to go back a little bit uh, in chapter 7 here in, in Romans. Uh, read with me in chapter uh, 7, verse 15. So it says, I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I 
don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. Then 18, and I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. And then 19, I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. Isn't this the dilemma we all face? Are you all with me? Even Apostle Paul, right, shares the same battle with us. And the fact that he's sharing this to the Church of Rome, our Christian brothers, our Christian sisters at the Church of Rome at the time, is also sharing the same battle. And this, this problem, if you agree with me, we've been battling this in our minds for a long, long time, right? To this day, we're battling that. So we're going to learn what, we're gonna, what we have to do about this. So if we go back to our main verse on 721, it says, this is Apostle Paul talking. I have discovered this principle of life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. So I inevitably what is wrong. Inevitably meaning like, it's like we can't stop it. We do it anyways. We already know that it's wrong, but we do it anyways. Why is that? I mean, even Apostle Paul shares that same experience. The difference is, how do we handle? How do we handle that situation? That's going to be the main difference. And on that verse 21, when it says, I inevitably do what is, when I do, when I do the right thing, I inevitably do what is wrong. So I think that as, Sometimes we still have selfish ambitions, right? We do good things, but then really deep in our hearts, did we really do that good thing for others or does it go back to us, right? If we we're honest, sometimes when we, when we help others, after the fact, we're like, ah, oh, that makes me feel good. I mean, there's nothing wrong with what we did. It was good. But then was that really the, our best intention? Sometimes yes, but sometimes it boils down to, it, like without even thinking about it, after the fact, we, we end up saying, oh, I feel so good. We just forgot about the, the, the person that we helped. It went right back to us. That's what I meant by selfish ambition. Like here, we could volunteer at the church Right, we help out, but then we have to, to search our heart. Is it because we want praises from people? Or even do we want a pat in the back from God? Do we help out to his ministry so we can go back to God and say, Hey, God, I did this for you. Now you owe me. Come on, give me some blessings. Right, there's, there's something, something in our heart that, that does that. We want to do what is good, but we can't. In 22 and 23, it says, I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is a war with my mind. There it is. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. So really, we have the desire. We have the desire to do good. We know it. We've been taught by it. We go to church. So we know what to do. We really know what to do. And we want to do the good things. So we have the willingness. But sometimes we lack of the doing part. We desire it. We will it. But we fail on the doing part. We decide one way, 
but then we act another. This is in line in uh, Mark 14, 38. Very famous uh, scene in, in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? When he uh, asked his disciples to, to keep watch with him, this is Jesus. When Jesus wants the disciples to pray with him, to keep watch, but what did the apostles end up doing? Fall asleep, right? And then what did Jesus say? That the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We have that willingness. I'm sure the, the apostles, they're willing. They were willing to stay up with Jesus. But then the flesh is weak. However, I know I'm guilty of this too. Sometimes we just use this as an, as an excuse. I'm like, well, my flesh is weak, so I'm sorry, I can't do it. But when Jesus said that, he said that so not they can make, be an excuse. He said that as a rebuke, right? Because now we have to do something. We can't just stop there and say, ah, my flesh is weak, right? Jesus wants us to do something. He wanted the apostle to watch and pray. There's got to be an action part right after that. It's got to be a verb. A little later on that Mark 14 in verse 27 and 31. Um, just go there with me very quick. See, on the way, Jesus told them, all of you will desert me, for the scriptures say, God will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. Peter said to him, even if everyone else deserts you, I never will. See, there's that willingness again, just like us, right? We always say, God, Lord, I'll do everything for you, Lord. Right? Kind of like Peter. We're just like that. But Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter. This very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny three times that you even know me. That kind of hurts, right? Jesus just called him out. But Peter said, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the others vowed the same. See, they all have the willingness. Peter and all of the disciples, they all have the willingness. Just like us, we're always willing. We have that desire. Especially when we're asking for something, right? When we're praying to God like, Lord, just give me this and oh, I'll do everything for you. Right? We all do that, right? But when time comes, we can't deliver. So there's willingness, but no doing. So what's the problem? What do we do? But before, before we jump in there, I want to go to our second S first. Because there's another problem that we, that we face. You know in the verses, this is that we know what to do, but I don't do it. I know what is good, but I can't do it. I know what is right, but I can't do it, right? But see, that was Apostle Paul. He keeps saying, I know. He know what it was right. He know what was good. See, another problem is, what if you don't know what is right? What if you don't know what is good? What happens then? See, that's where the Bible comes in, which is my second point. Statutes. Have you heard that word, statutes? Yeah, statutes. <laughs> I only learned that um, in our youth group. I guess there's, uh, I think, seven or eight ways to, to say God's word. There's uh, God's command, God's precepts, God's statutes. So that's another word for God's word, the Bible. So that's where the Bible comes in. We read the Bible. 
so we know what is right, so we know what is good. This is the place where we can, where we can find it. If you go to Romans 7, 16. Right, if you read that again, but I know what I'm doing is wrong. This shows that I agree that the law is good. Do you get that? But if I know that what I'm doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So basically, if we know, if we if we know that what we're doing is good, if we know what we're doing is bad then we agree with the Bible. Because the Bible will show us that. The Bible will show us what's wrong. The Bible will show us what is right. So if, so if we know and agree, then that means we also agree that the Bible is good. Because it will show us. Um, in Psalm 119, um, 11, one of our favorite verse uh, in uh, our youth group. I have hidden your word in my heart. That I might not sin against you. Right? So if we know his word, then we will not sin against him. But then, (laughs) we know God's word. We read God's word. But just like Apostle Paul said, but we still end up doing what's bad. We still end up doing what we hate, just like what the Bible said. We already know what's right. We know what's good. But we still end up doing what we hate. But, but I still want to encourage you. Read your Bible because that's how you're going to know. That's the first step, right? To know what's good and to know what's right. And do we have our banner? Because that's actually... One of our core value. God's word is our devotion. So we got to know this book. So we can discern what's good and what's right. We start there. To battle the power of sin in our life. But just like Apostle Paul said in 22 and 23. Right? Even though we love God's word. There is another power within us. That is a war in our mind. So we're still back to that. We already know the Bible. We try to follow the Bible, but we can't. So we're back to where we started. We love the Bible. We love his word. But part of us secretly rebel. Inevitably do what is wrong. And before we know it. Have you been there, church? Before you know it. You are already doing what you hate. Before you know it, you are already gossiping. Before we know it, we're already cursing. And right after that, and then we're like, oh, why did I do that? You with me? You been there? We know that's wrong, but we still do it. So what do we do? We're back to that same question. You'd be happy to know that Apostle Paul asked the same question. On verse 24, he says, Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? So what do we do, church? So when Paul said this, he's basically saying that he has tried everything. He tried everything he can. But he still needs help. But before we go to our third point, I hope that we actually tried all that we can. First, we tried what we can. We search God's word to know what's wrong and what's right. And I hope that when we search God's word, that we are actually convicted and tried our best 
to do what's right. And not just read it and just brush it off like, eh, whatever. Right? See, Paul here, he's already at the end of his rope. He has tried everything but failed. Because we need something else. The word is good. But we need something else so we can actually follow the word. And that brings us to our third S. We need a savior. Amen. We need a savior. In verse 25 it says, thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law. But because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. In other words, we can't do it in our own. We need a Savior who will do it with us and for us. We need God's Spirit within us and simply embrace what the Spirit is going to be doing in us. So if we need a spirit to do the work for us, what do we need in us? The spirit, right? How can the spirit in us work the sin in our lives if the spirit is not in us? So we always have to have God's presence in our lives, which is another core value of our church, right? God's presence is our passion. And then let the Spirit take control of our life. And let the Spirit fulfill the righteousness of the law by His power. So we need to bask in God's presence. Always invite God's presence in our life. And how we do that? You know, even uh, David prays for the Spirit not to depart from his life. Because it will. If we're living in sin. You see, Holy Spirit, right? There's the word Holy Spirit. And that word holy, that word holy will have a hard time to be in the same body that's wicked. A body that has all iniquities. And that's why David keeps praying, create in me a clean heart. Amen, church? We always have to confess our sins to God, to one another, have a clean heart. So we have a clean vessel so the Holy Spirit can bask in, our, in us. So the Holy Spirit, his presence can reside in us. And when the Spirit is in us, then we can battle that sin. Because on our own, it's going to be hard. On our own, it's going to be hard. So let's read um, chapter 8, 1 to 4, really quick. I, I really love how, love how Apostle Paul put this. It says, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Amen to that. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you, freed us from the power of sin. That leads to death. Can we say thank you, Jesus, for that? Amen. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. Oh, so good. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us. Who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. Amen. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for Jesus. Jesus is the answer. Amen. Amen. So what do we do? So first of all, before the spirit can even reside in us, 
we have to surrender to Jesus. Amen. Before the Spirit can, can even reside in us, we have to declare Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. And then we can live a life in a spirit. And this will lead us to freedom from the power of sin. Ah, so good. You can actually call back our uh, worship team as I conclude. So I don't know about you, but I'm kind of happy that we are not expected to obey God in our own strength. You with me? I mean, we tried, we tried, we kept trying, but we failed. But when we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, he has given us his Holy Spirit who enables us to fulfill the demands of God's holiness and free us from the power of sin. The minute we start doing works in our own strength, we discover that we are failures. But that's okay. The Bible said that's okay. Accept the fact of what we learn here in Romans 7, that we will fail. We will fail if we do this in our own strength. And instead, allow the Spirit to work out God's will in our life. And our example, Jesus Christ. Always the best example. Amen, church? Let's go back to the Garden of Gethsemane. He also had the will. He had the will to obey his father. Did he have an easy task? No, he didn't. He's got a hard task. But he willed it. He willed for our sake. He willed it. To go through the cup that he was going to go through. He willed it. But he didn't stop at willing it. He went through it and did it. He went to the cross and died for us. And now we can be free. And now we can receive his spirit. And now we can battle the power of sin in our lives. Amen, church. Are you with me? And then he said, let's go. In the end of that verse, it said, let's go. Rise up. In the same way, church. Rise up. Rise up. Clean our hearts. Ask God for a clean heart. Ask God for, for the Spirit to reside in our heart, for His presence to just stay in our heart, to stay in our lives. And as we battle, and as we battle this in our mind, as we have learned, let's fill our mind with godly things. Let's fill our mind with spirit things and rid of the sinful things in our mind. And let's just keep asking the Holy Spirit to reside. But first we have to surrender. Surrender our selfish ambitions. And let the Holy Spirit fully control our lives. Amen, church. Let's worship one more song. And as we worship, let's ask God to come into our lives. Surrender fully. Surrender fully for his, to his will. And ask for his spirit to come into our lives, to reside in our hearts, to create in us a clean heart. So 
desperate for you. Keeps playing. I want to give us a moment to look deep within our heart. Ask God to reveal the sins in our heart. Ask God to reveal the sins that hinder us from progressing. Ask God to reveal the sin that has power over in our lives. 
ask God to take it away from me because Jesus is like a rushing wind that can blow away the sins in our lives. So take this moment. Think of that sin in our hearts and give it up. Give it up to our Lord Jesus. sins that we struggle day in and day out, the sins that we keep doing even though we already know that it's wrong, but we keep doing it. Lord, you know it, Lord. And right now, Lord, we lift those up to you. Help us, Lord, to seek you more deeper by using your words. But most of all, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would just take over. We surrender everything. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would take over of our lives. Empty every selfish ambitions in our heart. Every ounce of selfish ambitions, take him out, O oh Lord. Empty it and fill us with your presence. Holy Spirit, fill us. Fill our hearts. And take control. Lord, help us. Help us battle our sins because we can't do it on our own. Holy Spirit, help us take control. Lead us to the freedom of the power of sin in our lives. Father, thank you. Thank you for finding us. Thank you for finding us. Thank you for your grace. You knew, you knew that we couldn't do it on our own. Even if we wanted to, you knew. So you sent your son to die so that we may live. Thank you so much. You know exactly who we are. You know how pathetic we are. The sinful people we are. But you loved us anyways. You loved us so much. You sent your son to die. Thank you. So I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would just reside in our lives. May your presence never depart in our heart. May your presence will never depart in our entire being, in our whole body. May we love you with all our heart, with all our mind, and with all our soul. Fill our minds with godly things. Fill our minds with the things that the Spirit loves. Help us hate what you hate. And help us love what you love so that your spirit can remain in us all day, all day long, all night long. Holy Spirit, stay, stay. Holy Spirit, remain in us. May your presence, Lord, may your presence just remain in us. Have mercy on us, Lord, because the moment you depart, Lord, we can't do it. So, Father God, stay. Stay in our hearts. Stay with your people. Stay in our church. Because you, you will always be the God of this church. Thank you, Lord, for your words. Thank you, Lord, for this, for this people that are here this morning. Bless them, oh Lord. Bless them abundantly. And all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. See you again next week. God bless.